Okay. Um, welcome everybody to a special episode of I'm Awake Now What podcast. Um, thank you for being on this special panel. My intention today was to bring our collective wisdom experiences and ideas about race, racism, and individually contributing to the long-term systemic change. My hope today is that we are able to inform, educate, and enlighten my global audience about the, this, this particular topic and see how we can continue to press forward collectively with our actions, our words, and our lives. So I'd like to start out by letting everybody go around the, the proverbial table and introduce themselves. Um, so I don't know if Paula Francis, if you wanna start first. Sure, um, I'm Paula Francis. I'm a campus minister with University um, Christian Fellowship in Georgia. Um, and our, one of our not roles, but uh, goals, or I guess the right word, is to dismantle white supremacy uh, within the church and parachurch culture. So um, over the past 13 years, Tamise probably knows more because Tamise has actually been one of my teachers and she's on the panel through this conversation. I've been engaging with what it means to talk about racial reconciliation and racial justice within the church. Um, and so that's why I'm here. I'm so excited to be with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Alicia, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I'm Alicia Harlish and Frank. I am a healer at Fiercely Optimistic in both California and New York City. Um, I've advocated for human rights for indigenous peoples at the UN and have done a lot of advocating throughout the country depending on the topic. So that's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Catherine, I think you're on mute. Are you on mute? Yeah, I am just because okay. of the family. Okay in the area. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me as part of this panel. I'm really excited to learn and share and reflect with everyone. Um, I am a, I'm Catherine Rodella. I'm a um, professor of educational leadership uh, in the College of Education at Washington State University on our Vancouver campus in Vancouver, Washington. Um, and I teach and research around uh, leadership for social justice, particularly in schools and colleges and education. And um, most of my students are teachers, uh, counselors who are becoming principals or principals who are becoming district leaders and superintendents across the state of Washington. Um, I like to joke that I have uncomfortable conversations about race, homophobia, heteronormativity, classism, with typically older white men. So uh, it's, and as a third generation Mexican American woman and the only professor of color in my program, I think that's, that's a part of that work too, my identity and how I show up also as a mother uh, of a biracial um, black, Jewish and Mexican young boy. So I, um, that's just a part of who I am too, as a Chicana mama. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, I should say full disclosure, um, Catherine, uh, I have the honor of being her cousin. So um, just full disclosure to the panel. <laughs> so we go way back, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another conversation we could talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Meet young people. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tamise, do you want to go ahead and give your intro? Hi, I'm Tamise. I live in the Hampton Roads area. I've done about 14 years of ministry work. Uh, just recently started my own nonprofit called Subculture Incorporated, and we seek to advocate for Black students by creating content and by raising funds for a, a crisis relief um, fund so that we help them when they face issues that might threaten their enrollment as a pathway for them to know uh, and have a meaningful spiritual life. So I'm a mom, I have a two-year-old named Harlem, been married five years in September, and just got my master's degree from Wheaton. So I'm, I'm moving and shaking. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Siobhan? Yes, hi, I'm Siobhan Hoover. I am from Santa Barbara, California, born and raised here. I have a unique perspective as uh, my background, um, racially, both my parents are mixed. And so I truly love having very uncomfortable conversations with people to bring awareness. Um, I am also a mother of two. I have a young boy who is 11. And so having a, a black son has really struck my heart during these times. 
um, and my daughter as well. She's very compassionate and likes to bring, you know, she's, she wants to understand. So um, I like to find balance in my life and practice gratitude. And so I'm hoping to be able to reach people and just bring my unique perspective to everything. Beautiful. Yeah, so I wanted to start with the first question to anybody, whoever wants to jump in first, is to just ask how has what's going on with our current state of um, the protests and George Floyd's death affecting you personally and in your own individual communities? I don't know who would like to jump in first. I'd be happy to. Um, personally, you know, I don't think that it just is about George Floyd. It's certainly the catalyst in all of this, but unfortunately, it's something that's been happening for so many years that I think people are finally fed up with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I am an empath. I feel, I feel everything. And so, you know, my heart hurts along with you know, the families that are affected by this personally. Um, and for me, trying to explain to children um, what's going on is really a, a, a tough job, you know. And so um, for our family, we are very open. My, my partner, he's Italian. So we, you know, everything is very mixed here, but we're very open and honest and kind of upfront. Um, so that's been our challenge. As far as our community goes, I feel that uh, Santa Barbara has stepped up. And I do have a lot of people um, coming to me asking questions. What can we do? What should we do? Um, and for that, I'm grateful um, for, you know, we had a protest here where I felt, um, and if you're not familiar with Santa Barbara, our community is mostly, um, you know, Caucasian and Mexican. And so we don't have a huge uh, black community here and so I, I was really pleased to see Santa Barbara coming showing up for everybody asking questions what can we do what should we do um, so that's you know my my take on that yeah how about you Paula well um, I'm in Georgia so the Ahmed Arbery hit us hard um, and I've been I work or I used to predominantly work with fraternity and sorority students who are uh, not only mostly white, but we're talking about white students in the SEC, right? So I've been uh, talking about Black Lives Matter and the importance of racial justice for years to, um, I promise I'll get to what you asked, Krista. Um, to so, um, and so what happened with, with the Ahmed Aubrey video is that it allowed for, um, for people to, to, to see that it's still here. So for people who are putting their head in the ground and saying, oh, no, no, stop talking about race, stop being divisive, it just really gave us, especially here in Georgia, since it was in our backyard, an opportunity to say, yeah, it's it's still here. This is not, this is not, we're not talking about 20 years ago, we're talking about right now. Um, and so it really opened the doors to really good conversations. I'm also a mom, like <laughs> I guess most of us here. Um, I have a seven month old and a four year old. So working in the middle of COVID while also doing this has just um, has just been exhausting, I think, for all of us. And so one of the, the gifts of that, I'm, I'm going to say gifts, is that since we have no daycare right now, um, our kids have just been coming with my husband and I to protest. And we've been able to say, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to talk about it. It's really given us opportunities to show, um, to talk to Harper Elizabeth, who's my four-year-old, about the issues that we're talking about. And I think why that matters so much with right now with George Floyd is because one thing that's happened in Athens, Georgia, which is the city that I live in, is that we've been advocating for defunding the police for a little over a year now. And so to, to bring up what had happened to my four-year-old, the first thing she said was, well, why do the police need to be able to have guns, right? So like the fact that a four-year-old is getting it, a four-year-old mm. is getting like, um, you know, like, and, um, I don't assume that everybody has the same opinion of the police, but it's just been a really interesting time. I think I, I agree with what Siobhan said about like, it's just really pulled back the curtain and almost like exposed this really ugly wound and has allowed us, those of us who've been in this work a while to say, yes, now you see the wound, now let's clean out the wound. Let's start having some hard conversations to actually like, I don't know, 
and I'm talking too much, but yeah, to really start, start thinking about healing and, and moving forward. So it's been, it's been a very interesting time. And then you compound that with COVID, which is just yeah. as the injustices, right? Um, which things always do. <laughs> yeah. Alicia, how about you? Um, you know, I keep on ebbing and flowing between being extremely, um, extremely happy with how the generations are coming together, how we are getting on the same page about defunding the police, how certain information is being shown and supported. And there's video footage, there's, there's talks, there's a lot of really beautiful momentum which I stand behind and I'm trying to spread as much as I can I'm, to do my own part, as well as um, petitioning, uh, advocating, uh, protests, calling representatives, making donations. I'm trying to do at least one thing every single day. Most days tend to have a lot more than that. Um, and then you go into the opposite of that, which is you wake up and you're just crying and you understand and can feel what the emotion is and the anger is for black and brown people. And it's, you know, as someone who has already been working with people for, you know, I would say two decades, to have other people to support it and then to also have other people not support it, it's just this constant back and forth of, you know, ups and downs and, and trying to figure out how you can best balance yourself while still supporting the cause. Because at the end of the day, you know, like as a white woman, I feel extremely guilty going to the end of the day and saying, I'm fucking tired, you know? And it's like, you know, the black community has been dealing with this for hundreds of years. And it's like, I don't have the right to say that. And I don't, I don't even feel that I have the right to feel that, to be honest. And so it's, it's this, this very new world that we're living in and, and I'm trying really hard to find what that, that balance is in order to keep the momentum, um, help make these positive changes that are inevitable, well, at least I'd like to think so, um, while still you know, taking care of myself um, and taking care of the community that I work in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's a lot, you know, it is, it is. Yeah. How about you, Catherine? Where are you at at this stage? Uh, um, <laughs> I hear Alicia's, uh, the, the feeling of this kind of split of wanting to have hope and then also feeling really uh, tired and overwhelmed. Um, before, I mean, we were already facing the kind of isolation and also seeing disproportionate impacts. You know, I'm also, you know, I'm a researcher. So for me and my, my partner, my husband does work in equity and diversity at our local county. And so it's just all in what we do and how we live and breathe and how we talk about this with our nine-year-old son. So we were already seeing these disproportionate impacts on Black, Latinx, Micronesian Islander and Indigenous communities of COVID. Uh, and then to kind of have this, th these real, um, I guess, vivid and horrible violent manifestations of white supremacy kind of come out, although we've known about it for years. Mm -hmm. And so, but in this moment, um, there is this kind of simultaneously, like there's these beautiful forms of solidarity. And I think being in Portland, so I live in Portland, Oregon, I work in Vancouver, Washington, and Portland is one of the whitest large cities in the United States. And so uh, what's kind of been amazing is to see the, the protesters being almost all white and they're out there. You know, we had this beautiful image of uh, people lying on the ground on their stomach on a really busy uh, bridge crossing uh, into downtown Portland, uh, thousands of people for um, almost nine minutes, right? And as, as a form of protest. Um, so those things I think give me hope, but I also was, I had already started teaching a class on race and identity and representation. So it was a part of like the conversations I was having. And it was, you know, the, the day, uh, the day after George Floyd was murdered, I had class to talk and we were talking about racism. And so it was just this kind of like, it's, it's just so much and to know how to process it and what it means and, 
And I think particularly as a mother of a multiracial child, um, and especially as a lighter skinned Latina woman, how I navigate anti-blackness too, particularly in the broader community, but also within our Latinx community and, mm -hmm. and facing the ways we were raised growing up, the comments made and, and saying like, and reminding, and you know, I mean, Krista, we're, <laughs> this is our, we're, we're cousins, right? It's like reminding some of our very family, like actually Rudy is black, right? My mm -hmm. son is black and we're proud of that, right? So don't mm -hmm. dismiss that. And just, you know, like, and, and I think that is a part of the work for me if, is what does it mean for me to stand with my husband, with my black family, mm -hmm. um, my, my extended, our extended family. And that to me is where I'm like, I, I think I've, I've gotten stronger I, uh, in terms of like, I'm going to do this and more resolute in it. But I've also, I think, been exhausted and not sure how best to kind of disengage with social media and the news sometimes, um, lean on some of our, you know, my kind of cultural upbringings of using the Mexican candles and lighting them and trying to bring in mindfulness, like, and I am, I mean, I was raised pretty Catholic and I don't, I'm not really practicing now, but like it comes in and I need it sometimes, right? I need that mindfulness. So um, that's how I'm doing. Yeah, to me, how about you? Uh, it depends on the day. <laughs> to be honest, um, yeah. I think one of the things that I've committed to this go round was that I was going to, uh, I was going to live my life in such a way that declares that it matters. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times uh, in the past, you know, with Mike Brown and Trayvon and the elections in in the United States, and I, I think for a lot of Black people, it was very taxing on our bodies, on our mental health. And this go round, I'm seeing a resurgence in self-care, like Black Lives Matter. And so I'm actually going to turn the TV off today, or I'm actually not going to answer that phone call, or I'm not going to respond to that email. And I'm going to have a glass of wine. I'm going to take a nap in the middle of the day. And that for me has been the way that I've sought to um, even declare to myself that my life matters. And, and that's been new for me. Um, but again, you know, you feel the familiar sadness um for black people mostly it's trying to decipher whether or not we're going to dissociate so we can go to work and mm -hmm. function or whether we're going to let ourselves feel all the pain and be unable to function which then affects our livelihood and relationships and so it's just unfortunate you know that we have to make these decisions so many times after so such a long period um and so i think that yeah it just depends on the day for me um how i'm doing yeah well thank you guys for all sharing your collective experiences one thing i did want to talk about is is the general discomfort and obviously i i intentionally chose a very diverse panel to talk about this because um from some of my multinational global listeners um you know, uh for example like i have some brazilian listeners who um they don't understand black and white because like everyone the, the, they only have their indigenous Amazonian people that live there and they consider those people Indian. They don't consider them black or brown or whatever. And everyone else is considered white, even if they're Brazilian. And then same thing with my friends from Trinidad or listeners from Trinidad that listen. It's kind of this, you know, race is different in every part of the world. And it's, it's, um, they're asking me um, through messages on the podcast, like, what, what is going on in America? Like, I thought slavery was over. I thought the oppression of Black people were over. Like, what is the stranglehold that white people have on our communities and our, um, our financial systems and, and everything like that? And um, I've already lost three friends this week that I didn't know were harboring racist <laughs> sentiments. I mean, it's been, it's been, it's been a water. Yeah, it's, that, that yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's been eye opening. So I kind of want to like get everyone's perspective and we can go around starting with Paula Francis of like, um, how do we like, here's what I'm feeling and I'll just give it back to you guys and see what you say. But like, I, I want to try to continue to have uncomfortable conversations. But if people don't want to hear me, what do I do? What's my next step? How do I how do I continue to make, you know, movement in that direction to educate people, even if they don't want to listen or, you know, what, what is, what is it that you guys are doing in, in your perspective areas? Well, <laughs> thank you for calling on me. I, I do want to point out that I'm like 
one of the two white people on this call and, and, and part of the conversation does need to be decentering whiteness, right? Um, and so I, 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 I do want to talk about the, your white versus other ethnicities. I am, um, I, for those who don't know, I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I'm, I'm originally from South Carolina, but like a lot of oil kids, my parents lived in the Middle East. And so, um, I, I'm familiar with people saying things like that to me, like, oh, America is this great country with no racism. In fact, when I, I moved to America for college, I thought that was true. I thought that I was moving to a place with no racism, which is funny that I thought that because I spent all of my summers in South Carolina. So clearly I was just being, putting my head in the sand. Um, and, and, I, and I bring that up to say that, like, first of all, racism, white people versus other people still exist all over the country, that racism does exist. And it's because and Catherine might want to correct me since she is the researcher on the call, and, and please do. But whiteness is not an ethnicity, it's a construct, right? And Benjamin Franklin actually said that Germans were not white because they could not adopt the Anglo-Saxon culture any more than they could change their skin color. I'm German, I'm German heritage, right? So that's Benjamin Franklin saying that I wasn't quote unquote considered white because whiteness back then was British, right? And whiteness has always been this construct to hold power. And in our country has been to hold power violently, right? It held power over the native populations when it stole their land. It held power over our Black American um, brethren when it, it held them in slavery. It has always been holding power. And so, and unfortunately, we have exported that, that feeling or the, the, the colonists have exported that to every corner of the world. And so like when I lived in Saudi Arabia, when I lived in Dubai, when I lived in Jordan, even when I lived in India, white had power. And again, it was held violently. And um, I hope that's okay to say, if anybody wants to correct me, I, I do, I, I, I'm totally, uh, <laughs> totally okay with that. But um, that doesn't mean that my privilege as a white person isn't real. That's very much real, right? My privilege and my experience is real. But I say that to like kind of push this narrative back of it has not only is it very real, but it is very real over the whole world that we still have it. And um, how I kind of engage with those conversations is actually, I mentioned before that Tamise is one of my teachers. Um, I've written about this before, but when um, Trayvon Martin died, uh, we were in, I think it was in Alabama. We were somewhere hicky. We're somewhere super rednecky, and I can say that as somebody from the South, right? It was like super rednecky, and um, we were watching the news, and it was this like incredibly sad moment about hearing that, um, hearing that about the the, the Trayvon Martin's killer was going to get off, right? And and there were these comments by these preteen boys. It was just horrible, and Tamise said to me, "You've got to start speaking now." And that was how many years ago? And I took that very seriously. She's like, you as a white person has got to start speaking up. And I was like, oh, I speak up. I preach about whiteness. And she's like, no, you've got to do it publicly. Um, and so, yeah, like just that I've got to, that, that admonishment from one of my, my black sisters and, and to like to engage in that conversation and to say like, what does it mean for me as somebody with privilege to both decenter my voice by um, elevating people of, Color's voice, which I'm not doing right now, so I apologize. Um, I'll shut up after this moment. But also to be willing to risk it and say, like, I don't care if I lose donors for the nonprofit that I work for. I don't care if I lose family or friends. Like, we are no longer, my family is no longer invited to some of our family's house. Um, and we're okay with that because this is what's right. And, and in our faith, we use evil versus not. And it, racism is evil. And I am called to stand against evil. And I'm called to use my privilege as a white person to say, I will, I don't care what the risks are. I will do what's right at all costs. That was a very long try. I'm so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> that was good. We hear each other. No, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Alicia, how about you? Can we change the order? Sure. I'm sorry. I'm just going clockwise. <laughs> totally. But it doesn't, okay, I'll it, kick, it I'll feels kick. off with the topic. Okay. okay. I'll kick it down to Siobhan because she's in my, le my left-hand corner over here. Okay, and this was relating to um, how do we get people to care, right? Yeah, um, how to have those so, uncomfortable conversations. Yeah, so several things. For one, um, I always recommend that people understand the history of all of this first. 
So I keep referring back to, I'll tell people, you need to watch the 13th on Netflix because it gives you a history of how this system was created, right? The system is doing exactly what it was intended to do, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, and I, I would like to say, well, you know, we're all Americans. We're, it's not a black or white thing, but unfortunately we're categorized and placed into these boxes. And so um, I'm actually, I'm wearing a shirt today and it says insight, insight, right? <laughs> um, and having <laughs> these conversations. So for example, you have family members, uh, same, same thing, um, Paula, I have family members who I just don't speak to anymore. We grew up in the church and I'm like, yeah, God is love. And I'm, I don't practice as, as much as I should. I pray and, and this, everything. So I, I feel like I'm more spiritual than religious. In any case, I do have family members who I'm like, I don't know how you don't understand that white privilege is real, you know? And so same thing. We don't have them over. We don't, we don't really talk anymore, but I also believe that it is important to keep those lines of communication open, right? You have that racist aunt that like wants to make a comment about, well, all lives matter, you know, and it's like, okay, well, auntie, if all lives matter, why aren't you upset about all these black people dying at the hands of police, you know, and, and really kind of like cutting in there and just saying, you know, no, no, you need to be, you need to kind of um, promote or not promote, but insight, in <laughs> embody. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I, you know, I, I think that um, forcing people to care is really difficult, mm -hmm. but maybe um, educating them and saying, look, I don't, I know we don't agree. However, it's important that you know this. I have a, a great grandmother who um, she is, uh, well, she passed, but she was Mexican and native. And one day, and please forgive me for the term, but she wanted some Jap chilies from the store. And I was like, well, Nana, you can't say that, <laughs> you know, but you, that's not a nice word. And she's like, well, why not? That's what they are, you know? And I'm like, well, because it hurts people's feelings when you say that. And she like had no idea. So sometimes it's just about educating and being like, actually that hurts when you say that. And whether you think, you know, whether you're using it as a derogatory term or not, it doesn't matter if it's, if it can hurt somebody else, you may not use that kind of language you know what i mean so i think that forcing people to care is difficult but kind of providing a different perspective to it is is really helpful in helping them like oh okay i get it now yeah having courage to do that course correction is like a good foot to start on i think is what you're getting at and i think that's great advice yeah especially with family you know with family it, it's really difficult uh, and i i keep talking to my um, family who are evangelicals and I'm like God is love and I'm sorry there's a there's a little bit of hate coming from your side and I don't think that this is what it was intended to be you know so yeah yeah <laughs> but we could do a whole podcast episode just on that to me um, where where do you shake out in all of this um, dialogue so I think if I were trying to get uh, white sisters and brothers to engage in the conversation. Um, one of the things that I think is helpful is to, um, the thing about whiteness is that it's very individualistic. So what I try to do is show how whiteness is an ideology and a program and a concept um, that hurts everybody because it's not an identity, it's a thing. Um, and so I think what I've tried to do is show uh, people how whiteness has actually been robbing them. And um, one of the main things I think with it is this sort of exceptionalism. And that is a global reality, right? Like, so this exceptionalism that now creates the, the litmus test for our um, like manners, for our intellect, for our... Um, place in society. And so I think what we have to do collectively is to really think about how is whiteness, first defining it, 
and then figuring out how is it robbing me of the life that I was meant to live? How is it robbing me from flourishing? And I think that that really kind of takes the sting out of an us and them kind of mentality. And then we're looking at this thing as a subject to study and to, I'm on a mission to tear it down. Um, but I think for me, that's been the easiest way to do it because there are so many ways in which these conversations go left and people, um, it's, it's really kind of hilarious how people can take, you say one statement and they immediately think you're talking about them as an individual being a racist. Mm -hmm. And there's something to that. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is um, I'm hoping that some of these conversations would be taken out of the realm of hurt feelings and put into the realm of like injustice and murder. <laughs> because I think when, when it's hurt feelings and then people can fall back on intentions, right? Well, I didn't intend to hurt anyone's feelings. But when you move it out of that category and you talk about culpability, right? And you talk about people having ownership over things that are happening in front of their eyes, I really see the shift kind of taking place. So I agree with Siobhan. I think having the conversation about feelings and then leading them down a path of saying, but it's way bigger than that. Like, it's not even about your intentions. Um, it's about injustice and what we do in the face of injustice. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of conversations that I, that I typically have with um, people who are beginning the journey. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah well said. Catherine? Uh, well, there's just so many powerful things that I want to respond to that everyone said. I'm like taking notes, like the <laughs> professor in me, like one, two, three, what do I want to say? Oh my gosh. Um, okay. So I guess the way I think about this, and if, if it's like, a, if I could, if I frame it as like advice or like encouragement, particularly for you, Krista, and your global audience, there's a few things I, you know, my professora wants to say. First, <laughs> I want to say, um, I think about my work as planting seeds and lighting and starting fires. So I've had students in my classes, and, and, and in, in many ways, it's, uh, so there's this power dynamic where I still assign them a, a grade, but then they might be from particularly um, privileged positions, generally speaking. And if you're superintendent of a school district, you're making a good amount of money, right? So there's these like layers of, of power and weirdness that have happened in some of my classes. And I think about it as, that person may may sit there and be quiet and then maybe evaluate me negatively for my actual job um, and my course evaluations. But I try to think about the students in their districts and the, the kind of the end result of what, what my job should be, which is to push their thinking to change practice. So part of it is, some of it is just to me planting seeds and then you just never know years, months, you know, weeks down the road when there's something will spark in them, when the seed will germinate. But I knew I planted it and I gave it a lot of rich kind of resources. I planted it in good, strong soil that were the lessons, the learning of history, I think Siobhan mentioned, which is so important. And if I can say something, I, I want to plug, it's a, a slightly older documentary, but it's called Race, the Power of an Illusion. It's three episodes by PBS. That is transformational for so many people because it, it really in pretty um, accessible ways talks about race as a social construct and then how racism was, was tied to colonialism and the conquest and genocide of indigenous communities and then the enslavement of African people and tied to capitalism. And, and, and one of the big things, I think particularly in the South, one of the big uh, tricks of white supremacy, tricks and like schemes was that working class and um, lower income folks uh, who are white had so much more in common with newly enslaved black and African people post the civil war. But one of the tricks was kind of the, you see this absurgence of the of Jim Crow laws and segregation and trying to separate them because they actually had a lot more in common than the rich planters and plantation enslave, slave, enslavers that had mm -hmm. just lost the war, right? Mm -hmm. So part of it is kind of that history is given and then finally, the way that um, even when segregation was outlawed, you had things like housing impact, how people understood uh, race and, and you de facto. So anyways, that's a good plug to understand race in the United States. I think that documentary is really powerful. Um, but I other, also think about 
particularly for international audiences, I find it really interesting, particularly in Brazil, that there's no discussion of blackness <laughs> because and 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 what that means, right? And so I would encourage so so one thing there is this and I I couldn't help myself. It's like really behind me. Another plug. There's this concept of racial formation, sociologists of race, uh, Michael Omni and Howard Weinert. Uh, it's a classic book, but they talk about um, race as these racial projects, something we've created as humans. So that 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 is something we continue to make and remake. So as Paula mentioned, that like at the turn of the century, uh, 1900s, Irish, German, Italian, Polish immigrants were not considered white. Right. So who gets to be? And so right now there's a lot of debates with sociologists are like, when are, are Latinos, are some Latinos going to be able to be white now? And I think, and I would argue, and I'm just going to say this and hopefully our family doesn't hear it, but like there, we have some family members who I think are benefiting from their proximity to whiteness in my own family, my, like, yeah. and who do not see their lives intricately, it, it like tied to other people of color, particularly undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. When our family benefited from crossing the the border in 1920 before the 1924 Immigration Act, so it's like that kind of stuff. It's like, and so what I feel is like with family. So it's different with my students. With my students, I'm gonna have an enormous amount of patience and kindness. With my family, and I'm not saying I'm gonna be disrespectful. I'm gonna try, but I'm also tired of hiding that part of me that has been this kind of radical hippie liberal up here in the Pacific Northwest from a lot of my family members who I think have pushed back on that so much. And it's really upsetting to me. Uh, and I feel like that's the thing that I, I think if anything, this has changed me and my, I'm not hiding post from all of them. Like they're going to see everything. Now it's like for everybody, they can see what I'm writing on Facebook. Um, but I think for the international audience, it's important to think of what are those racialized logics in their countries? And that mm -hmm. has a lot to do with colonialism. And so what sociologists, like the people who wrote that book say is that immigrants come to the United States and we have our own kind of racial logic and ways of doing race here that really began with this kind of encounter between um, the uh, British settlers and indigenous nations and um, black um, and Africans uh, who are brought over and enslaved. So I think about, um, I would encourage them to, in, to investigate their own racialized logics in their countries, because then they'll understand that stuff intersects the United States, but those exist elsewhere too. And mm -hmm. I would encourage them to do that work so then they understand how that can intersect here. And so they can also do some anti-racism work in their own countries too. I think particularly in places like Brazil, where you see uh, right now with the coronavirus, particularly, um, Black and African Brazilians and multiracial Brazilians are being impacted in unfair ways. And so those are the things I just think that example is really interesting to me and I'd encourage them to do that um, and do some of that critical work too. So anyways, that's what I have to say, but. Yeah, I'll come back to your, your family statement in just a bit because I actually do have something to say about that. But Alicia, back to you um, about your, <laughs> I don't know if you remember the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like there are a lot of different um, avenues that I'm taking right now with it. One is to be extremely direct. I have, I was very, uh, I was very emotionally entangled when I first started to see the um, Blackout Tuesday. And I noticed that those that were doing that weren't posting about the um, organizations they were donating to, the petitions they were assigning, the representatives they were calling. It was this cop out to say, hey, guess what? I'm not a racist. And mm -hmm. that really upset me. And so I was going, I can't tell you how many people blocked me online, <laughs> but I was going and I was copying and pasting and posting it on everyone's black square of like, well, what are you doing? Like, tell, share with us and tell us what you're doing. So I do think that like we need to have those uncomfortable situ those uncomfortable conversations with individuals um, about white privilege. And while I, history and knowledge is extremely powerful at this point, because when someone hits you with what their belief is, and, and I say belief because I don't believe that it's a true fact, it's the facts that they've been fed through, um, through the government and through the news outlets, you know, you have to be knowledgeable enough to have that conversation. And also you have to be patient enough to say, you know what, I don't have information on this right now. Let's circle back to this and then give yourself that time to do your research. But it is really important that we are having 
these conversations, especially about white privilege, because people don't know what that even means. There are, there are so many layers to what white privilege is that someone would, honest to God, not think that whatever they're doing or saying or involved in is white privilege. And it's one of those, it's one of those pieces where it's like, well, unless there's an outsider coming in and saying, hey, you know, like we need to have this conversation, um, you know, without emotion involved. And I think that that's another piece that's really difficult when it comes to racism, period, is that because, especially I feel as women, we're so, um, we're so in tune with our feminine energy that just wants to nurture and give. So we get triggered when these things are happening and we just want to, you know, give all of our emotion to this other person or organization or whatever it is that's going on. And it's like, we, we actually need to be a little bit mindful and be more into our masculine energy logically going in and saying, okay, this is, these are the facts. Let's discuss this. Let's see where this viewpoint came into like I had a discussion with someone earlier today about internships I'm like there shouldn't be internships that is tied to apprenticeships which are tied to slavery right like there that should not be in our system today there are so many intricate details in our society that the systemic racism is constantly being funded by what it is that we're doing what it is that we're saying and and our lack of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, I guess I just kind of wanted to tie into what Tamise said and, and Catherine about, Tamise, you mentioned just about on your response about helping people recognize their conditioning and then um, Catherine with our family and stuff like that. One of the things that I've had to unlearn is this idea of being American. And um, the idea of being American in our family um was like being white you know and rejecting my own hispanic background and assimilating so far into my own society that i felt uh, that i felt like i had to marry somebody white and like have white children and all of these things because the american dream also included all those things and so like, even though Catherine, no, don't worry, no one's watching this podcast from our family because we're way too <laughs> progressive for them. <laughs> so, no <laughs> one. Um, but I, I, I agree that within, in our family construct, there are people, our lighter skinned cousins who have married into white families and uh, have white last names and are um, sort of parading around as white people, but they're not white, they're Hispanic. And they're, that rejection to me also is part of the problem in our community. Like I'm just speaking on, on behalf of my community, the Hispanic community where we feel, and, and there's a spectrum, it's not one or the other. Um, but for me, that, that's been a really strange thing to unlearn when I started this podcast, um, you know, it was the intention was around uh, unlearning my own indoctrination in the Catholic church and becoming a spiritual person, which nobody agrees with in my family, except for Catherine's side. Um, they're like, you know, they're my little sheep, my black sheep that I rolled over with. But um, part of it too was recognizing that like the indoctrination and the conditioning even goes further. It goes so much deeper than just the religious thing there's there's such a there's like a racial component to it um even my parents struggle with racism themselves and i didn't know it until i was an adult and they felt comfortable to tell me about their own you know how they feel about certain races it's it's been really strange so um that's kind of long-winded but i wondered if collectively any of us on this call are also unlearning some things about our heritage in in the process of this is as any of that familiar to you guys as well i mean i could definitely chime in my my mother's 100 percent ukrainian so i always identified as european growing up mm -hmm. to be honest because i i never felt american i've traveled all over the world and it's always really interesting because it's like the biggest compliment when people are like, oh my God, you're American, you're so quiet. And I'm like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> so, so if anything, it, it was the opposite for me, but that I did grow up in a European household. So, um, you know, 
I, I kind of saw a lot of what, what wasn't, um, it just, it didn't feel sit right with me and it didn't sit right with my family. And so we were, we were definitely outsiders kind of looking in. Mm -hmm. Siobhan, how about you? Since you've come, you've come from such a mixed background. Yes. Um, I, I think that's a really good question. And I kind of, I wrote it down, like what, what have I been unlearning? But um, for my family, for example, uh, my, my dad, his mom is Mexican. She's from Mexico, speaks Spanish fluently, you know. His dad um, was, is African-American from Louisiana, you know, down South. And um, learning about what their families thought of them getting together, they got married very young. Um, and there was a lot of pushback on both sides. So for my grandmother's family, they were like, uh, you're not marrying a black guy, you know, that is unacceptable. And I believe that they disowned her for a moment. Um, but once they started having children, then, you know, everything changed. So, um, and even for my, um, my grandfather, you know, the black side of the family, they were also like, you married this Mexican lady? Like, no, you know, and on both sides, they face that. Um, and so I, I feel like sometimes it, that sort of stuff carries on through the generations. Fortunately for me on that side of the family, it, it was really kind of knocked out at that point. Um, all of my, my dad, they had four boys. So my dad's brothers all married someone outside of black or Mexican, uh, which I think it makes a little rainbow for that side of the family. On my mom's side of the family, her father um, was from a, a wealthy, well-to-do family um, in a small town called Carpinteria, which is right outside of Santa Barbara. My grandmother is Filipino and um, Native American. And so really when, when she got together with him, it was more his family that was unaccepting of their relationship. And unfortunately, my mother never had a relationship with her white father because of that. Um, and so we have reached out recently to him um, to say, hey, look, guess what? <laughs> You've got all these minority grandchildren <laughs> running around here. Um, and he's uninterested in, in pursuing any kind of relationships, which is fine. Um, but going back to it, the, the generations, the older generations, I think, you know, kind of bringing them the perspective, like, look, we are your blood and this is what it is. And if you're an accepting of that, okay, well, you know, maybe let's have a conversation about it. So, you know, I, I do have that unique kind of angle on both sides of the family. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that a lot of that has been squashed out with the exception of my mother's father's side. So, yeah. Siobhan, may I just say that when when we are rejected from that type of love from family that I truly believe that the divine comes in and gives it to you in more ways than you will ever be able to even completely embrace so I it, it breaks my heart that that's the situation in your family but I just I want you to know that you'll be if not you've not Thanks. already seen it you'll be very taken care of in this life Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I do believe that. I believe that if our hearts are in the right place with it, um, you know, it's kind of on them and that's something that they have to live with. Um, yeah, exactly. That's really their growth work, <laughs> not yours. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, yes. Thank you for that, Lee. Thank you. <laughs> um, Paula Francis, you wanted to say something? Cool. <laughs> Someone else speak for a second. Um, I wanted to say, you said about unlearning. Um, I was raised to believe that the Civil War was actually called the War of Northern Aggression. Um, because again, I'm from a South Carolina family. Um, my family owned a plantation um, and slaves uh, back in the day. And I was told um, the, the, the lie that Catherine talked about that was uh, taught in Reconstruction about like, um, and Jim Crow about like, well, you know, the 
poor soldiers, they weren't fighting for slavery. Like all these lies that were fed to reconstruction were, were created by white supremacy to continue to keep people apart, right? And as a, as a South Carolina family, I was fed those and I thought they were real because when I went to school in Saudi Arabia, that's all I knew about American history. Um, and so I get to Emory University in my junior year, um, I get told by three of my best friends that I'm a racist. And it was the best conversation I have ever had. In fact, the number of times that my friends of, of color, my black friends, my Asian friends, um, my Hispanic friends have called me out on my racist shit has been the most healing things ever because I've been able to unlearn. And I think that's the word you used, right, Krista? Unlearning things. Unlearn these lies I've been told. Um, my family actually probably will watch this because my mother also thinks I'm a black sheep, but she's like a super proud mama. So she even <laughs> listens when she hates what I have to say. Um, so I do. <laughs> uh, uh, but your I, mom. <laughs> I, I do when I just, I, 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 I was one of those people. I, um, and I did have to unlearn all that stuff, right? I had to learn that I had to unlearn that this history that I had been told, right? The like the happy slave, that that was a lie that the, uh, we are over, we are over slavery. We're in this post, uh, race, this post or colorblind society that that was a lie. Um, and it was, it was because of really wonderful men and women who are willing to say, you're racist, let's discuss it. Um, and then me being willing to like, take a step back and say, I, I am racist. And, um, I bring that up because there, I, I love what Alicia said about, uh, the squares, right? Um, one of the things that I, I think, can I use the word brag, is that I work with a lot of white students and most of them are doing more than posting black squares. In fact, one of my fraternity men who's white uh, posted yesterday that we have to tear the system down because it was built on racism and there's no reforming it, there's just tearing it down, right? Um, and so I was asked recently, like, why is it that all of these white University of Georgia fraternity and sorority students are on board with quote unquote tearing the system down? And it's because I've been very direct about unlearning narratives. Um, it's because I've been, uh, uh, Denise mentioned like talking about how white supremacy actually impacts all of us in a very negative way. Um, and I found the most helpful way to, for me to unlearn it is to be direct, but to also be graceful and say, yes, you've been, you've been fed a whole bunch of lies and they are negatively impacting you. But you know what? You can come, you can still learn. You can still be part of this family. And one way that I've done that is I've been very honest with how, while I've been on this journey for, I'm really bad at math, but let's say 16 years, um, being really honest about when I screwed up and that I'm still, I, I still have these racism. So like last week I had to be called out by a friend in Virginia who was like, that post you put up was not okay. You are centering your voice and you need to take it down. And being okay with saying, you're right. It was not okay. I was centering my voice. I'm really sorry. And learning how to be, how, learning how to get good about apologizing and relearning, um, I think is a really good way to help any of your, either your, your white listeners or people that are white passing um, to get into this conversation. Because it, it's not enough. It's not enough to get angry and to go protest. It's not enough to get, to give to organizations. Like, do those things. Please, please, please give to organizations. Give financially but also do the inner work in your heart, which is only gonna happen if you address the racism that's there, which I think that if you live in this country, it's there um, because it is just, it's so ingrained and we're swimming in it all the time. So yeah, I, I, I do, I've had to learn things um, and I am so thankful, I am beyond thankful for all the men and women who have been so patient with teaching me to unlearn the lives I've been taught. Um, sorry, that was. No, thank you. Anybody else want to pipe in right now? So I, I kind of want to say, I think that, I mean, everything is just, it's hitting me and I'm also feeling so like, well, I just want to react and just say like, this is just giving me life. So thank you all because I am so tired all the time of like, <laughs> I mean, not that I, I feel like I have so many supportive friends. I have a lot of friends who are starting to like kind of go through the reawakening or this awakening for the first time for themselves. And I'm like, thank you. Because when I was telling you this in high school, like you guys were like, they didn't mean it like that. Like, you know, they were, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, go do your work. And they were doing it. Uh, but a couple of things, you know, I was, 
I, I really resonated with a lot of what was being said because it's also the personal side and the work that we have to do internally. So being, mm -hmm. you know, as Paula, was, Paula Francis was saying, like being called out and sitting with it. And what does that mean to do that hard work? But I think of, so professor moment. So like racism, <laughs> this I think really important. To, so there's the like individual, like what kind of we're talking about these individuals and the, the social. Uh, so individual can be that kind of internalized racism or, or stereotype threats, like these ways that we, it, it's becomes embodied within us. Mm -hmm. um, as I think Tamise really talked about earlier in terms of like feeling it and, and what is the radical act, I think of self-care, particularly for, for black people right now like that that is a radical act of self-preservation and um and i think that's really important to call out the individual and then the social and, and interpersonal kind of interactions of racism and then institutional which are like within schools within policing within like laws and how they're codified and then the broader kind of societal historical like how we got here mm -hmm. and and particularly the impact of colonialism but moving away from being a professor i think about the internal work and going back to krista where you're saying about you know and it's about our family so it's really personal but i remember something that a friend of mine has really encouraged me she's um uh, mexican-american her family's from michoacan in mexico and she talks about uh she does this work on hood herbalism so in la in the la area they talk about this kind of hood herbalism as like healing getting back in touch with our indigenous roots of like recovering and reclaiming what was taken away and so a very personal story that's connected to our family, and since none of them are going to listen to it, it's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're just on the run from our family, actually. So, here, guys. <laughs> we're, it, this is just like a healing for us, right? Like yeah. all of you are here for us to heal. I'm sorry. No, just kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> part of, I think, the American, move towards Americanism and assimilation into that identity and the reject, is also the rejection of our indigenous roots. Mm -hmm. So part of it is um, I had to learn in 2005, a stranger, a shaman in Peru told me something about our own family that I did not know. So this shaman who I met and was working with says, he's reading my hands and he's doing this, you know, we're doing work together. And he's like, you're not your grandmother, but your great grandmother was a healer, a curandera. And she, and he's like, but the rest of your family rejected it. And so I'm like, well, that's weird. Cause he's just making this up. Like, I just, I actually didn't believe him. I was like, mm -mm. I go home sitting in the car with my mom. So, and I tell her the shaman said this, it's like, is there any truth in this? Like, was your grandmother a healer? And she starts crying, like sobbing. Okay. Our great grandmother, Antonia, Abuelita Lazara's mm -hmm. mother, was a curandera. And her father was a Wesero who would heal with bones. And when they moved from Mexico, people would still find them. But the church in it, where they lived in Texas said, do not do this. And so our grandmother was really upset about her doing this because her church said it was bad. So I think about like that and what it means to like try to recover it. So how did I ever get like, what was the, the moment of like trying to reheal from what I feel like has been for me, sometimes a toxic relationship with the Catholic Church, right? That mm -hmm. there is some toxicity in what had happened and what transpired and guilt and all of those things. And so I remember that moment of like, you know, what does it mean to try to retrace and go back to our own ancestral roots in deep ways? And sometimes that is uncovering really tough histories like Paula Francis is talking about, like claiming and saying, my, my people have been enslavers and I need to reckon with that. Or mm -hmm. saying, part of our legacy is like history being erased because of fear of, of oppression here. So there was real reasons for it, but also that like there are these deep histories and I think they're, um, they're embodied in us too. And so I'm trying, like that's something like a new project for me, just thinking about what does it mean to recover that? And part of it's doing this work with my friend on like healing roots and kind of going back to it. Um, and so what her, what she's done, which is incredible, and I can always share it later, but her and, um, and I'm forgetting the, the initiative they started, I apologize for not knowing the name, but um, they have gone and created altars around the protest. Cause she's like, what is my role? And so she'll do like, uh, you know, uh, limpias or like kind of cleansing rituals for protesters out there and right in front of like the LA detention center. So it's yeah. really powerful. Wow. I'd be happy to share that. It's beautiful. And they've done like 
huge kind of like with with rose petals and like created these altars and are like just a center to go and heal because of the there are folks out there kind of on the front lines and what does it mean to come back and take care of themselves too and so how do we get in touch with that to bring it to the forefront so that just i feel like it, it felt circle to like what's going on with here but the very personal like revealing the very personal when racism is this broad institutional thing too right i want to check with everybody real quick before we continue on we're in the hour do you guys have a, a, a few more minutes to get a last questions in is everyone okay on time sure okay cool yeah, yeah. i think to catherine to your point and then i'll, I'll i want to pass it back to to me on another question here is um that I really, so like my, my spiritual journey has been a, a lot based, a lot about awakening and, and, and breaking my conditioning and everything I was told I was supposed to be, and then connecting with the larger world around me. And because of that, I've become more enlightened to all the things that I was sheltered from. And so like, I even had a great deal of ignorance to overcome because of the way I was raised. And even I was raised in that weird Catholic sect that my mom dragged us to. Don't even get me started. Um, <laughs> and so like, I just want to say this one thing about the Kunandera thing is that um, I just interviewed a shaman for the podcast, Don um, Jose uh, Ruiz. He's the son of um, Miguel Ruiz, who wrote The Four Agreements. And he actually told me the history of, of, the, of our healers, of our, our, our indigenous healers. And I don't know why, this is really silly, but I don't know why having, being bilingual, it never dawned on me that Kura meant to heal. Because we were, I was indoctrinated that Kuranderas were witches. And so it was something so negative and um. something to push away and I didn't realize, like, even though I literally know that word means heal to put it together as a healer, um, it was like eye opening to me to realize like, oh, I've even been miseducated about my own heritage in this whole process, mm -hmm. because my parents have decided to reject not only their heritage, but our indigenous uh, roots, as, as you mentioned. Um, but my last question for the group, and I'd like to start with you, um, Tamise, is just like I want to be able to give the global audience um, our own different collective ex um, wisdom and experience and education about like okay so we have a larger conversation here what can each person go back and do in their perspective communities how can they get involved no matter whether they're white black Asian Hispanic um, what can they do on a daily basis to uh, Al Alicia's point of like no, don't just put your black square on Instagram. What else can we do? Because I think I don't, I know for me, I don't want to lose the momentum of this moment because for me, it's been extremely liberating to feel like, okay, now we can go at 150 miles. Like, let's do this. So to me, um, what advice do you have for the global listeners about what they can do in their perspective communities to, to keep this going and, and, and let's, let's fix this yeah sure now the professor might know more than me <laughs> but i think again where i try to go is having people take stock of themselves and so for me i think the first thing to do when you get off of this podcast slow down and do some thinking um i think that understanding whiteness and how it shows up in the world and then recognizing how that plays out in your own life and taking steps each day to resist that. Because I have to be honest, there are a lot of goodies that come with whiteness, okay? So the, it, it will be costly, but I guess my pushback on that, um, Sister Alicia talked about this, about the costs and being direct. The pushback I have is that one of the most frustrating aspects of whiteness um, is its commitment to um, invulnerability and comfort. Um, and I would say that that's kind of a facade for flourishing and thriving. Mm -hmm. That's not actual thriving and flourishing. The best things often come out of vulnerability and discomfort, right? Like art, music, we have innovation that comes out of those places. And so I think for us to begin the, to change the narrative of um, 
what vulnerability and discomfort can produce as opposed to spending our entire lives trying to get away from that. Well, I don't want to be vulnerable and I want to finally make it. And asking yourself, what does make it mean? Is make it living a, a comfortable life where you're just invulnerable to things? Or is it having deep relationship? Is it having having an integrated way of being about yourself and, and doing things in the world? And so I think people have to first start internally. Um, before they could ever try to go after a system, if that makes sense. And um, even in terms, I was hearing you all talk about religion, and I think um, it's okay to chuck religion, <laughs> um, because especially here in, in, uh, in the States, uh, Christianity is very intertwined with white supremacy. Um, and so you, you are not even dealing with the whole piece of the pie, and I think that people should kind of go on a journey um, of reclaiming some things. There's a lot of movement in the Black community right now about reclaiming African religion and spirituality as well. And it, it's just unfortunate because I believe that the American church was working with one-fourth of what we were supposed to understand about the divine, right? Like you have the Roman Catholic split, so then you have the Eastern Orthodox and they get, you know, they're over there in the corner somewhere, and then you have the Reformation, so that cuts the half into a fourth, and they bring that mess to America and then try to use it here. And so we lost the embodiment. We lost the connection to the earth. We lost the things that we could learn from peoples and tribes. Um, and so I think that right now, what I'm doing in my own life is I, I don't need a label right now, but I'm embracing some of those things once I realized that embodiment was is my portion in life, you know? Like I'm supposed to be integrated. And so I'm gonna actually resist the disembodiment that comes with trying to success or climb a ladder or how am I defining success? Am I defining it in having health and life in my relationships and death? Or am I defining it with having a lot of money and being able to pick and choose who I have relationship with? So to me, I, I think that's a roundabout way of saying, first, we have to take stock of ourselves. Second, I think we need to change the narrative and redefine um, what invulnerability or redefine what flourishing actually means, because it's definitely not invulnerability and comfort. That's not flourishing, right? And I think if people start to do that, then it's, a, it's less scary uh, of, of a journey um, to go on. So that's what I would say. I know that's a little abstract, but that's my answer. And then give money to black organizations. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. No. <laughs> yeah. Alicia, we're, we're, you're, you're so active um, in, in helping activate people in your community. I mean, like you're living and breathing it all day, but I know I, I'm just the only one that knows that on this call right here, but like, what are, you, what are some tools you'd like to give the, the audience? Um, so I'm going to answer this in, in two different ways. One is an advocate and one is a spiritual being. Um, we have to make the phone calls to the representatives. It takes, you know, yes, that can take a lot of time. Um, but we need to start to voice that that does actually change the, the pro progress of where our political parties are standing. Right. Um, so there's that we do need to make those donations. Um, Black, um, Black Visions uh, Minnesota is a great organization. Um, there, I mean, there's so many organizations, Campaign Zero, um, Black Lives Matter. There's, there's a lot of them and you can get a little bit more honed in onto your, into your area. But the cool thing is, is that when you really do start to go online and start to talk to people, they will lead you like, okay, this is a great organization for LA versus New York or Detroit. So there's that. Um, sign those petitions, you know, something that's really, um, you know, when we start to just get involved um, and protest, I know that that is a scary thing with COVID right now. And I will say that I've been going, I've been to about a half a dozen protests in the last couple of weeks, um, both in LA and San Diego. And, um, and mind you, you will not find one picture of me online at a protest because I think that that's the most, I feel that it's disrespectful um, on many different parts and I don't want anyone to get hurt if their face is in a photo. Um, but the, we, we here are practicing social distancing. We're all wearing masks. It's been very safe. And, and the cases where we've had an incline in outbreak with COVID um, have all been at church, have been at um, you know offices, things like that. So I do feel that the people protesting are being protected. 
So there's that, but continue to have those conversations. Um, start to evaluate yourself, evaluate your actions and evaluate your circle. You know, that my new favorite saying is um, white silence is violence, right? And like, it is, we are violating ourselves when we aren't speaking up. And so it's really important that this is just kind of being shown, um, know what your facts are. And then in the spiritual aspect of things, um, this is an important time for us to rebuild our community. I feel that a lot of veils have been lifted. You are seeing which people are, you know, whether it's racist, not racist or anti-racist, right? There are three different categories. So allow that to be, have those conversations, but also know where your energy is serving and, and where you are investing it. Um, take care of your temples. I, I do believe in nonviolence with your body. So this is where we do have a vegan or, or a vegetarian lifestyle, but like you have to start to treat your body like a temple, like a sacred being. And so that you can give, make sure you're meditating. Um, we, and make sure that you're having these conversations. I'm, I'm so grateful to have these conversations with all of you beautiful women today, because it's, you know, this is, we're planting seeds and we're, we are giving in ways that we have no idea. Um, and I'm really excited to kind of see that. And then last but not least, defund the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Siobhan, how about you? What tools do you have for the listeners? Uh, okay, well, several things. Um, growth really happens, we all know this, growth happens outside of our comfort zones. So getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, that whole cliche thing, it, it's actually real. And I, and I think it's important. Um, you had also mentioned unlearning, you know, what are we unlearning? And a lot of it um, for minorities is being unaccepting of any inferiority and really truly understanding who you are and where you've come from. It was funny that you mentioned the Culandera because I, I'm into oils and crystals over here and and that's what my guy calls me. He's like, oh, she's a Glendera. <laughs> so it's something <laughs> that I'm striving to be. Um, checking your own heart um, and really kind of asking yourself tough questions is, you know, you have this inner dialogue with yourself every single day. You talk to yourself in your head the most out of anybody else. So it is important that we're saying the right things um, in you know, encouraging yourself and, and speaking life to, to yourself. But also if your heart is not there, really kind of taking a step back, engaging like, okay, well, where can I gain perspective? Who can I speak with that would actually give me some insight as to what might be happening? Um, and, I, and I also agree with Tamise when she had said, um, understanding whiteness. <laughs> It's like, well, maybe you might have to do a little bit of research on that and, and find out what it means to you. Um, the last thing is just being open to the other perspectives. Um, there's, it's, it's going to take, quite honestly, it's going to take white people to create this sort of change, right? It's going to take those stepping up, like Paul Francis saying, you know what, yes, this is my family and I'm sorry, I, I actually made these comments, you know, how can I learn? What can I do better from here? Um, and, it, and it's difficult to really being vulnerable to that. You know, nobody wants to be criticized. Nobody wants to um, be pointed at and saying, hey, look, I don't like that. Nobody likes that. So um, again, just being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, there's a company called beware the humans and they had this message um, and it said divide and conquer and it was crossed out and then it says unite and prosper. So really collectively coming together as, as a community, as a, as a people with your family, whatever it is, uniting and, and, and you know, getting that, that message out um, is really important. The other thing is voting <laughs> and especially here in the states we have to know who these representatives are mm -hmm. we have to know their background what they you know believe in and people do grow so maybe they have said something 20 years ago that they don't necessarily agree with now but that needs to be confronted 
Um, and so using the boat as a way to get um, racist politicians or, you know, attorney generals or whoever, whoever it, you know, is, is in place that we are like, oh, I don't know that you should be making decisions for the entire country is definitely, and on a local level as well. Um, mm -hmm. Just understanding who's who, um, I feel like is, is really of importance right now. Um, we had someone on a, on a Facebook feed who was just being awful and ugly. And I said, look, this guy's a public servant. This guy is a firefighter and saying these things actually should be brought to the attention of the chief. So calling people out and kind of like putting their names out there. This is this person. This is who they are. Here's their photo, you know, and really kind of being brave and courageous in that way is really necessary. So that's my two cents on that. <laughs> I have to jump in on Siobhan really quickly oh. because I think it's um, <laughs> because you know I think that this whole thing about finding out who people are and alerting their employers and then you know how people love to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and talking uh -huh. about how people are judged by the contents of their character. So people find it unfair that you would tell their boss that they're actually racist, but yeah. they're being judged by the contents of your character. And y'all love to post about Martin Luther King Jr. You know, I think it's, I think that that's great. I think we should keep doing that. Yeah, Absolutely. and I think that there's been a collective, um, a collective generational um, inaccountability. I don't, that's probably not the right word, but like lack of accountability for a lot of races. Um, and even like Catherine, you had mentioned, um, you know, all of us doing our part in our different races. And, and I know, like, even within the Hispanic community, there's racial tension with other races. And so it's like, we still have, and there's not a lot, of, I think for me, the thing that's been bothering me um, for the entirety of my life with what we're seeing with racism and the injustice, the overall injustice um, with financial um, livelihood and all of that is the lack of accountability. And so it's very bizarre to me that people are just like, you know, you're finally trying to hold somebody's feet to the fire and they're like, no, don't tell my boss that I'm a racist. And you're just like, what? <laughs> but um, um, Paula, to pass it to you, uh, what tools do you have to give to the listeners today? Yeah, so I, uh, I want to be very careful and speak uh, specifically to, to white listeners because I, I want to say something hard. But I think it's really important to start using the term we. So uh, Amy Cooper, what she did was racist. And it's very easy for me to say, Amy Cooper's a horrible person. But if I'm honest, which I hate being, I have done that. I, I haven't called somebody for not telling me that my dog is always leashed. But I have feared black men. I've never called the police on it but I have locked my door when I was in downtown Atlanta. And so instead of always pointing the finger, using terms like we, um, and that's been really helpful for me to divest in the power of whiteness, right? So like I was born in 85, um, so I was not alive during civil rights. But using the term, my family was benefited from Jim Crow laws, because we did, has helped me to really divest into whiteness. I think for those of us who are, who are white Americans, European Americans, however you want to, uh, to frame it, to really use that term we really helps, uh, or has helped me, it may not help everybody, so I don't want to assume, but it really helped me, has helped my students to learn, um, to have empathy and to, to try to, 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 to decent, or to try to take ownership. And, and when, the other thing is to, um, when you're learning more, which please, if you're listening to this, read books, not just blogs. Um, but when you're learning more, uh, try to realize that only European Americans are individualistic. And we keep attacking these program, these, these pro uh, problems as if they're individual issues. And they're not individual issues. They're, they're collective, right? And again, it goes back to using the we. So when you're reading them, um, I, who said the, um, the meditating? Like, meditate on it, meditate, Alicia, thank you, Alicia, meditate on how it feels, feel the feels, like, and it's talk about, like, talk to somebody about it, talk about your therapist, but, but realize that this is collective, this is not, um, and then the systemic, I think, uh, I just want to start calling you professor, because you're just so wise, Catherine, but it's, 
um, as Catherine was saying, like um, there are different types of racism and we have to start addressing the systematic racism. And one of the things that's gonna happen is people running. I don't mean to bring it back to my daughter, but I was filling out my absentee ballot, ballot and she said, why is it all men running? And if she had been able to know their skin color, she would have said, why do I only get to vote for white men in my city in Georgia? Our town is 40% not white and we're 62% women. Why in the world do I only get to vote for white men? I'm not hating on white men. I'm married to one. My son's a white man. But um, right, like we, we can look at uh, how countries that have handled, co that have women leaders have handled COVID better. I think we just need to yeah. pass the reins on to women, which means women have to run, which means we have to give money to women politicians to run. And um, yeah, so we, we need to get more people running for every every race, right? Like I, I love what Siobhan said, like local elections matter. Everything is local. Vote in every election, get people to run in every election. And if I hear, and this is to my evangelical brothers and sisters, which probably aren't listening because we're usually not open-minded enough to listen to things as wonderful as Chris's podcast. But if one more person mentions dead babies, I'm going to reach across the screen and smack you because for some reason we want to talk about abortion, but we don't want to talk about the, the, the babies at the border or the babies who are dying at the hands of the police, or I'm sorry, that's my little soapbox, but like, stop. If you're listening to this, I'm sorry that I got passionate about that. Stop focusing on one minute detail that whatever, focus on the big picture. The big picture is that our country is being strangled by white supremacy and the only way we're going to end it is by voting and getting people to run that are willing to dismantle white supremacy. And we've got to work together and we've got to stop dividing lines and saying things like, well, you know, they're Buddhist and I'm Catholic or I'm a evangelical. We've got to band together and work together and focus on the major thing, which is dismantling white supremacy and saving our country, dismantling the system so we can, um, we can get better. So yeah, so vote, run, do the hard work. Oh, last thing, get offline. It involved in a, an actual organization with actual real live people. So you can sit in a meeting with your mask. I'm all about social distancing. I'm with Alicia. Every single protest I've been to, people have been in six feet away and wearing their masks. But get in front of our, our black moms and grandmas and listen to what they have to say about organizing. And don't just post on Facebook, but go to the meetings, hang out with the people who are doing the hard work get offline. Make sure that somebody knows your name so they can call you out on your shit when you mess up and also can help you to learn because it's not going to happen online. It's got to happen in real life. Sorry, that was a very long, I'm, I'm clearly passionate about fundraising, uh, about that was running. So good. That was may good. I will, yes, that was really good. Like, may I make a suggestion? I need yes. you to not say you're sorry for using your voice because you oh are so gosh. powerful. I used to tell her about that all the time. I know, girl. You do not apologize for using your voice, for saying what you got to say. You do not apologize for getting in somebody's way or making anybody uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You, uh, I, I really love what you're saying and everything that you stand for. And so I do not believe that you need to apologize for, for taking up time or anything like that. You're, you're amazing. And I really love the idea of, of we, you know, how you had said we. And so if there are, for the listeners, if there's something, if there's an injustice happening and you see it, think about if it was your son or your daughter or your uncle or your father or your family member. So Paula, thank you so much for that. And, I, and again, you don't be apologizing to anybody or anything. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah. You must have been talking to Denise. That's been like a whole relationship. <laughs> I should tell her I would charge her a dollar every time she says sorry so I could it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, Professor we'll donate Prima. that dollar. <laughs> <laughs> donate the dollar. Okay, we'll end it with my Professora Prima right here with her tool. Oh my gosh. Well, she's got I'm your, yeah, it's embarrassing. Don't call me the Professora. It's something I have had to own as a as a professor. <laughs> okay, guys, her. just side note, she's been a Professora since she was like five years old. I mean, this is so she's just been like, I'm not even kidding you. Like you've been the most mature child I've ever known in my whole entire life. And Rudy is just the same. <laughs> and it's amazing. And I love that about you. And I love that you've always been La Profesora my whole life. 
Thank you. That's very generous then. You've been such a nerd and, <laughs> and little She's mother like, head. She's like, you were born with glasses <laughs> and a little cardigan. <laughs> no, pretty much. <laughs> not here. Okay, I do have a cardigan. Uh, so I just, I, I mean, I kind of almost just feel like we should just end it right now because I feel like it was such powerful testimonies coming from everyone. Yeah. Um, the only things I will, I want to reiterate something to me said around folks doing their own kind of inner, inner work. And I would say there's this idea of, of writing, like actually writing, reflecting, journaling about our own cultural autobiographies, like who are parents, who, like where do we come from, how do we, because part of that can unearth work that we didn't realize. And I always, uh, some, an assignment I give some, a lot of my students when I first start this, these conversations is what are those, those critical moments um, what I call critical race moments that like something happened when like a friend was called something or your parent did something or this happened in school like these they stick with us they're imprinted on us and they and and being able to write in journal or get it like write poetry or sing or get it out in some way is so um, healing and important to do to begin to to be anti-racist and to do this critical important work the second thing I want to say is to not require, this is specifically for um, white and non-black people of color, to not require the energy of um, our black um, community members and family members uh, to teach us. And I would also say other kind of people of color, but I wanna really call out um, and say as someone who's a non-black person of color that we need to also confront that anti-blackness and in our communities and the tensions among us. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is uh, getting involved in the local, in our local communities, just like the examples that were given about um, that when we're political actions and particularly in local government elections are hugely important. When we're going to see defund the police, a lot of it's going to happen at the local kind of city and county governments and yes. we can hard on them. Um, and I'm seeing that happen here because sometimes you have how can funds get diverted from police departments into services, for example? Or what does it actually mean to get that done? Um, and then, you know, part of that too, I think, is getting involved in local schools. And this is something that has probably been the thing where my, the hardest thing that I've posted, talked about, worked with my, my own friends on, is are you willing to send your children to racially diverse schools? Or are you sending them to the charter school outside of your boundaries? Are you, are you moving to find the best schools for your kids? And what does that mean? And so that to me has been a really hard conversation, one that I do think I'm almost at the board of losing some friends about, like right now. And, but you know what? I'm just like, whatever, I'm gonna do yeah. it anyway. Bye. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> well, because I'm just like, I'm tired. Because they, they'll say things even about schools in Portland and, and some of my friends who are like, oh, I can't send my kids to Portland Public. And I'm like, my son goes to a school in the, one of the whitest cities in America with over 80% other kids of color. It's so segregated. And most of our schools are some of the most segregated spaces. Sure. But someone once said that schools are laboratories for democracy. And they're also, so there are these wonderful possibilities within schools and being involved in them, you know. And then also they can be places of trauma. For, for, for children of color, particularly black uh, young children and young adults. So I think those are places to get involved and to open spaces for um, particularly black, indigenous, and other parents of color to be able to stand with them and stand beside them as they seek to advocate for their children for equity and justice in the schools. So that's my, those are my three things. Just three, super easy. <laughs> Snaps. <laughs> Well, we might have to make this like a reoccurring quarterly call or something. I feel like because yes. there's just so we can't solve it all and explain it all and teach it all in in one session. I just wanted to come back to a couple things that I thought were really awesome about what everyone said. Um, uh, Tamise, you talked about rejecting the disembodiment, and I I understand that on such a deep level because of my religious upbringing, not because of my race, and I think that. Um, the other part that you mentioned in that same piece about the creating the labels, one of the things that I've, like, growing up in my religious experience, there, there were just boxes that everybody fit into, like, and everybody's life experience fit into, and that unlearning translates into my racial experience as well, that I've had to unlearn and to not put people in boxes, not put myself into boxes, and lead with a, a high level of 
curiosity and um, just a humility and knowing that I don't know. And that's, that's been something that's been really key in, in my own life journey. And one thing that has struck me for this, my whole life, I think, but especially when I went on my spiritual journey that I think is really resonant in this moment is that one thing that continues to frustrate me um, because I just like, I'm, I am also type A, so I like want to fix everything. Alicia probably knows this really well about me too, but um, just the, the fact that you can't teach empathy. Like I, I often think like, the, like I think in I think of problems in terms of root causes because I work all day in quality management systems, which our whole goal and purpose is to find the root cause, uh, create a solution, could do continuous improvement, and then remitigate the next solution over and over and over again. So my brain that's how my brain works. And when I think about like there's multiple faceted root causes to to racism and why it's systemic and why it continues to propagate all those things. But one of the root causes that really gives me pain is that you can't teach empathy. And, and I don't know, you know, I think the, the awakening that Siobhan and a couple of you also said too, there, I think there is this great awakening happening. And in our spiritual community, um, you know, we use this term a lot. And for me, that's why this podcast is called I'm Awake, Now What? Because it's like, I'm awake and now what? What else do I have to learn? What else do I need to, where else do I need to lend my voice? Where else do I, I need to lend my, my platform and all of those things? And the, the being able to teach empathy, I think, is critical as we raise children, as we um, center ourselves in our, our, our particular biospheres and pull ourselves out a, a degree, I think is really um, critical. And then last thing I want to just wrap up to say to the, the listeners is, even I feel sometimes a sense of um, lack of courage to say something. And, and this whole movement has made me realize that too. Like even I've become a little afraid to speak out, not because I'm afraid to speak out, but I, because I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. And it's made me realize that that just means I haven't done enough of my own education with my black brothers and sisters who can teach me what, what their going through and where they need support and how I can show up for them and things like that. So I guess I want to say to the larger global audience, show up anyway. You're not going to get it right, but your intention of showing up is enough and you'll learn through trial and error how to show up for all of our Black brothers and sisters who need us so desperately in this moment and have needed us for hundreds of, hundreds of years. Um, so um, I'm going to leave it there unless anyone else has anything to say, but I did want to thank all of you for being a part of this panel and for letting me use my podcast to talk about this because I've, I've been just boiling over here in, in, inside just needing to talk and work through all of this um, in, a, in a vocalized manner and feel like how can I contribute and, and hopefully, you know, this, this will touch people regardless. Um, and, and I appreciate all of you guys taking the time out of your day. And this came together really quickly. And to me, I've never met you, but I think you're amazing. And I, I hope we could get to continue this conversation. Thanks and for having me. please find each other on social media to, to befriend each other. And, and Catherine, what, what do we need to do to bring the curandera back to our family is what I want to know. <laughs> Keep planning, having more conversations like this. <laughs> So it was so good. lovely to meet each of you. You guys are amazing, amazing women. I feel honored to be here today. Yes. yes, thank you. I only hang out with really awesome people now. <laughs> <laughs> Choose your circle wisely. <laughs> you ladies That's are right. <laughs> the universe is sorting that out for you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, guys. I love you guys. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet everyone too. Thank you. Bye-bye.